And welcome to a truly under-the-table edition of the Oddity Archive. The show that keeps it so much on the download that we're downright filthy from constantly skimming the floor. Seriously, nobody ever cleans around here. But anyway, today we're going to dig into a bit of collector's lore. Specifically, we're going to take a look at a pretty lengthy period in which, here in the U.S. at least, the very act of owning a print of a film or recording something off the TV could potentially get you a visit by the FBI. Now, that's not to say that there wasn't a fair amount of real piracy going on back then, but just about everything that we're going to look at today is more about things like fair use, right of first owner, life of the print leases, and that sort of stuff. So with that, I've got, for all intents and purposes, four stories lined up for you here, three of which revolve around raids on film collectors conducted by the FBI, and then we'll end things with an admittedly abbreviated discussion of the quite famous Betamax case, as it's come to be known. And of course, that's the one that decided that, yes, you can legally record stuff off the TV. <laughs> yep, it's very much legal legal day here in Archive Land. I already told this story in the Ballad of Raymond Rohauer episode, but it merits an expanded revisit here. The opening salvo on over 20 years worth of FBI raids on film collectors occurred in 1959 when film professor slash historian slash author William K. Everson helmed the Theodore Huff Memorial Film Society or the Huff Society for short, a nonprofit which once a month would screen a classic, oftentimes silent, film. That year, MGM remade Ben-Hur, which they first made in 1925. In the name of compare and contrast, Everson arranged a screening of a rather battered 16mm reduction print of the edited 1931 reissue of the 1925 film. Full disclosure, Everson hated the new 1959 film. In a bit of simultaneous synchronicity and spy versus spy type behavior, MGM wanted to ensure that nobody was screening the old silent version of Ben-Hur while their remake was in theaters, ostensibly because MGM was embarrassed by the old film and wanted everyone to think that this was the first stab at a film adaptation of Ben-Hur. At the same time, film collector, and also noted pirate, Raymond Rohauer, who himself was in hot water with MGM at the time, tipped off the studio about Everson's screening. Shock of shocks, just after Everson's screening ended, the FBI swooped in and seized the film. Given its academic nature, the Huff Society was, for all intents and purposes, legal. Having said that, for the life of me, I can't confirm the legality of Everson's print. We know it came from MGM proper, but whether it was authorized or not is anyone's guess. Regardless, for whatever bizarre reason, the FBI quickly relented when silent film actress Lillian Gish intervened. No word on whether or not Everson ever got his print back. The Huff Society continued on with no further incident until Everson decided to call it a day in 1982. In a supreme twist of irony, to this day, movie studios are known to call upon private collectors for source material for their remaining copyrighted and even sometimes public domain films that they've either lost or let rot away. And yes, Everson's collection, now held by the George Eastman House, 
is one of the ones still being routinely tapped. As best as I can gather, there were six major FBI raids on film collectors during 1974 and 75 in and around Hollywood. All of them were orchestrated by a young, ambitious, Los Angeles-based assistant U.S. attorney by the name of Chester, a.k.a. Chet, Brown. Easily the most high profile of the 74-75 raids was against actor Roddy McDowell, mostly remembered for the Planet of the Apes films these days. McDowell, like William Everson, was an avid film collector, but in McDowell's case, he didn't really care where the films came from, he just wanted a nice collection. The FBI first came calling on McDowell sometime in November of 1974, asking him for an interview regarding his dealings with noted film pirate Ray Atherton. As best as I can tell, McDowell did not respond. On December 18, 1974, search warrant in hand, the FBI descended on McDowell's North Hollywood home. Officially, the FBI seized at least 1,000 videotapes and 160 16mm film prints. Some of these films were legal. For example, there were copies of films that McDowell acted in, and McDowell was known to have it written into his contracts that part of his payment would be a copy of the film. Other films were legit studio copies that McDowell acquired second, if not third, hand, which falls under right of first owner. Some of McDowell's videotapes were his own off-air recordings, which as of 1974 was still considered a gray area legally speaking. But there is no escaping that at least a few of the films in McDowell's possession were indeed pirated and purchased seemingly knowingly. On top of that, McDowell had a habit of making videotape duplicates of films. The FBI came up with a, uh, call me a cynic, probably inflated figure of $5,005,426 for the seized films and tapes. At 1,160 films and tapes, this works out to $4,315.02 per title, all in $1974. To put this in perspective, Playboy founder Hugh Hefner was a notorious and especially financially generous film collector, who routinely paid $500 for black and white films and $1,000 for color films, and sometimes a few thousand for then-recent films, like The Godfather and The Exorcist. Conversely, McDowell's films, outside of his own, were often more relatively obscure 40s and 50s titles that he had nostalgia for. How this worked out to over 4300 bucks a pop is beyond me. Anyway, McDowell got off the hook by naming names, most notably the aforementioned film pirate Ray Atherton, who was charged, but had his conviction overturned in 1977. McDowell also ratted out comedian Dick Martin, of course, of Rowan and Martin, singer Mel Torme, and actor Rock Hudson, who the FBI already had a nice dossier on, for very different reasons. Incidentally, upon hearing the news, Rock Hudson quickly went to work on building a secret side room for projection and a separate film vault, all fronted by a would-be fireplace. For what it's worth, Martin, Torme, and Hudson never got the dreaded visit from the feds. Now, I haven't found anything concrete, but I believe that the FBI invoked the use of civil asset forfeiture and never returned any of McDowell's films or tapes. I do know, however, that thanks to his naming names, 
Roddy McDowell's reputation amongst friends and colleagues took a massive hit, and his career took a nosedive after this incident, which he only started to come out of in the mid-80s, but even then never regained his old prominence. In December of 1986, Chet Brown was charged with obstruction of justice and perjury regarding a fraud ring he was investigating. Brown was found guilty of encouraging witnesses to commit perjury in front of a grand jury, presumably in the name of sweetening his own case regarding the fraud ring. Brown admitted he was under the influence of cocaine while giving his legal advice on the matter to boot. Brown's credentials were sent all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court in Washington, D.C., and the court ruled to disbar Brown in a perfect 9-0 vote. It took until 1988, but Brown was sentenced to six months in prison. His current whereabouts, or if he's even alive for that matter, are unknown. This is Tom Donahue, owner of Thunderbird Films. If you enjoy movies like these and have a home video recorder or movie projector, you may enjoy them now without sugar-coated commercials or edited-out scenes. We have everything from Charlie Chaplin to Linda Lovelace, and a not-so-modest collection of literally hundreds of movies in between. Write today for our huge free movie and videotape catalog, The Thunderbird Films, Los Angeles, California, 90065, or telephone area code 213-256-6566. A home movie buff says that three FBI people sees the best of his collection, the Three Stooges, Dracula, and such. Well, if nothing else, the feds didn't discriminate. We've covered a respected academic and a famous actor. Now let's look at a raid on an average person. And it's worth noting here that in the eyes of the FBI, a quote-unquote large collection consisted of a minimum of Six films. This is one of those small fish. Robert Bob Frischman worked at a Kroger grocery store in St. Louis, Missouri, and outside of work was a big-time film geek, often advertising in and buying off of other collectors in the film collector's newspaper, The Big Reel, which I did a Ben's junk on a few years ago. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Anyway, a Frischman didn't make copies of any films, he didn't screen them for audiences, he spent more in acquiring films than he made in selling off films he'd grown tired of. In short, Frischman was simply a hobbyist. Why FBI agents targeted him over anyone else advertising in the big reel, which is loaded with such ads, is anyone's guess. Regardless, in April of 1977, two FBI agents posing as film collectors contacted Frischman over some of his prints, showed up at his home, purchased one title for $200, like a drug bust, and proceeded to seize the bulk of Frischman's collection. The agents had no warrant to search the place. The agents were actually denied one due to lack of evidence. Frischman proceeded to call the local police to send an officer over. They refused. I picked up the phone. I called the police department. I told them there were some people in my home that claimed to be FBI agents and they were going to seize my property without a warrant. Uh -huh. I said, I'd like you to send an officer over. I wouldn't do it. As for the films in Frischman's possession, since they were purchased from other collectors, which in turn were often purchased off other collectors, Frischman had no great way of knowing if they were originally sourced legally, and given the collector ethos, I doubt he particularly cared. Either way, the burden of proof was on the FBI, and they seemed to know it. Frischman and another collector friend, one of whose films was being lent to Frischman at the time of the raid and was seized, sued. 
On the morning of Frischman's trial, the agents returned the film collection and all charges were dropped. It took until the fall of 1981, but the whole thing finally fizzled out. Frischman and his co-plaintiff were denied any compensation by the court, and of course the Fed's case against Frischman was already long dead. But by this point, the powers that be had their sights set a little higher. About one in every ten families owns a home videotape recorder. A Hollywood studio and production company had claimed the machines were being used to illegally tape copyright material. Just as the record labels had been up in arms about audio tape since its consumer introduction in the early 50s, the movie studios and TV networks were in a tizzy about home videotape. It's no accident that early videotape machine manuals almost always have a copyright disclaimer about recording off-air. Even though there were home videotape machines as far back as 1965, Sony's Betamax, introduced in 1975, appeared to be the first videotape format poised to gain mainstream acceptance. In 1976, Universal Studios and the Walt Disney Company delivered a 12-point lawsuit against Sony regarding their Betamax machines. The two companies claimed that, since its primary purpose was to time-shift off-air recordings, which at the time was true, remember the first significant pre-recorded titles didn't drop until the fall of 77, that the Betamax was fully intended to bootleg major movies and TV shows. Apparently news shows and such didn't exist. Anyway, in March of 77, the California District Court dismissed two of the 12 counts, both regarding perceived Lanham Act trademark violations regarding false advertising. In the fall of 79, the California District Court ruled that off-air recordings, as long as they weren't being duplicated, sold, publicly screened, and so on, constituted fair use, and that Betamax had significant other uses, by this point home movies and pre-recorded titles being two, and as such let Sony off the hook. Universal and appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court. In the fall of 1981, the Ninth Circuit partially reversed the previous ruling, most notably the part about home recording. Read, the Ninth Circuit decided off-air recordings are illegal. Having said that, I should note that royalties on blank videotapes, just like the ones imposed on audio tapes, were one suggested potential remedy. This time, Sony appealed. In 1983, the case found its way to the Supreme Court. By this point, an estimated 10% of American households had some type of video recorder. Portable consumer video cameras had been on the market for a few years, and official pre-recorded tapes, including ones from Universal and D had also long since become the norm. And I'd be willing to bet quite heavily that at least a few of the Supreme Court justices themselves owned VCRs by then. This time around, it was ruled, once and for all, that recording programs off-air for personal use qualified as fair use. In January of 84, the final ruling came in at 5 to 4. Having said that, the ruling didn't fall under any particular political split. The court was considered five conservative and four liberal at the time. Three conservatives and two liberals voted in favor of fair use. Two conservatives and liberals apiece voted against fair use. Look at it this way, you can consider yourself slightly badass for any pre-1984 off-air tapes you may have kicking around. Dirt, clean sweat, kills odor, all of it. Got enough deodorant to keep the clean smell going. 
Like most of my history lessons, this isn't intended to be definitive by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, if anything, it's more of a greatest hits or just some kind of little sampler platter. So if you are interested in digging a little deeper into this stuff, let me make a few recommendations. So first up, uh, this book is available as a proper hard copy, but I've only got it as an ebook. Uh, this is called A Thousand Cuts by Dennis Bartok and Jeff Joseph. And this is all about the film collecting subculture. And this kind of rounds up everybody from the worst of the pirates to people that just got caught in the crossfire to the most upstanding businessmen. So aside from that, uh, this next book is really a history of silent film, but there is stuff on the Huff Society in here. This is The Parades Gone By by Kevin Brownlow. Uh, it's from the late 60s, but it is actually still in print, as am I making this anyway. And then lastly, for some online reading, if you want to pull up the Wikipedia page on the whole Universal slash D Company versus Sony case or series of cases. If you go there, you can find the Justia articles on all those cases and you can read the briefs and all sorts of stuff. And particularly with regards to the final Supreme Court case in 83 and early 84, you can not only read it, you can actually listen to audio of the actual testimony. So, uh, bottom line, read a book sometime, kids. It won't kill you. Anyway, that is it for today's archive. Join me next time when I'm paid a little visit myself by the FBI. The fully bureaucratic Illuminati. But I can't actually confirm that.